Hey everybody, Organized Biology here. The cells of your body are like your house. It's got all these structures that help it function properly and keep you alive. So today we're talking about cell membrane proteins. Now why are we learning about membrane proteins? Well, I always tell my students that most diseases like type 2 diabetes, like sickle cell anemia, like myasthenia gravis, all of these are caused on the microscopic level, usually within the cell membranes proteins. All those diseases have something to do with the membrane protein getting screwed up. So we have to understand these guys in order to understand all diseases and also health as well. So what do I mean by a membrane? Well, a membrane, as you've watched in my cell membrane video, this is a phospholipid bilayer. So here's the membrane right here. This is surrounding the cell itself. So this whole thing is a cell and it's also wrapped around the organelles of the cell like the mitochondria and the nucleus. And all of those things require this little barrier to basically separate out the internal and external environments. Now, some things can't pass through the membrane unless they have proteins embedded in the membrane. So we need them to get vital things in and out of the cell. Furthermore, we need proteins embedded in these membranes to connect cells to cells, to basically transmit signals, to tell the cell what it is. So there's a variety of different membrane proteins that will quite literally do the work that the cell is doing. Now, the real question is proteins. Okay, you've heard of proteins like in your diet, right? You eat proteins maybe from meat or from, from some vegetable sources, but what are our proteins? Well, if you've watched my protein synthesis video here, you know that proteins are basically the structure and function of all cells. So all these membrane proteins are going to have some sort of structure and an associated function to do something for the cell. But how did all of these come about? Well, once again, in that video, I taught you that the nucleus of the cell in the center contains that DNA, which contains the instructions on how to make the protein. You transcribe that onto the mRNA transcript, which looks something like this, which will eventually go to a ribosome and get translated into the protein itself. And depending on what that protein is, it might get embedded in the membrane like we see here. So all these proteins, I want you to remember, the cell made the proteins itself by reading the DNA. Let's jot that down up here. But keep in mind, you're made of 30 trillion cells with all different structures and functions. So therefore, those cells may have different proteins than the ones I'm showing you here. So depending on the cell, it might have more of these proteins, or depending on a different cell, it might have more of these. It just depends on what that cell exists to do to make those cell-specific proteins. Now, great. So the goal of this video is to show you the general classes of membrane proteins so that when you get to them in your textbook, you're reading your classes, you'll be like, oh, I remember that from this video. So let's get right into it. So I'm going to start with the easiest ones here in the middle here. This guy right here, if you look at the structure, you can probably determine what he's doing. Well, this guy is called an integral protein. And it contains these long threaded proteins right here called intermediate filaments. And if you think about your cells in general or your body in general, you're connected skin to skin and heart to heart muscle and skeletal muscle to skeletal muscle. They're all connected, right? And most of the time they're connected by these integral proteins where these filaments literally bind or weld multiple cells together. So there might be another cell maybe right here that it's connected to, right? So these would be connected by these integral proteins. Great. So you have a slew of them. It depends on the cell type. But then we look over here on the right side. They're going to basically transfer information. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, this guy right here is called a G protein coupled receptor. And fun fact, 70% of our pharmaceutical drugs actually target these specific types of receptors. Now, what are they? Well, you can see there's a part on the outside that kind of looks like the receptor aspect, and you'd be right. And that receptor will bind some sort of signal, whether it's a drug, but usually it's a hormone or a chemical, and it's going to bind to that receptor. Once that receptor binds it, this protein will change its structure ever so slightly, initiating this protein called a G protein. So now that that G protein is activated, it will do some sort of cellular function or cellular change. And this is usually some sort of cascade of events where something inside the cell increases in the amount or decreases or something gets thrown out of the cell, what have you. So just depending on the G protein coupled receptor, it'll induce a different cellular change. Now you guys can see that this one has like a little flag, right? And usually flags indicate identity, right? Like in the United States, we have a flag that shows we are of the United States. Well, your cells also have these membrane proteins that serve as cellular ID tags. These are often called glycoproteins because there's actually an aspect of a sugar, usually the flag part is the sugar, attached to a protein that's actually in the membrane. And this will basically tell your cells, hey, I am a human cell, don't attack me. But if a bacteria were to get into you, they'd have different flags than you. Therefore, your body would attack it seeing that that bacteria would be foreign. Now, if you've ever heard of autoimmune diseases, 
any autoimmune disease is usually when a T cell in your body actually looks at this flag that's a human cell flag, right? But it sees it as foreign and actually attacks the cell. So that's where autoimmune diseases come into play. So clearly you see already that there's hormones and drugs and autoimmune diseases all linked into these cell membrane proteins, which is why I'm telling you these membrane proteins are important. And if this has been enlightening so far, please click that subscribe button and the like button so I can make more videos like this. Okay, so now into the more complex proteins. And all of these proteins are going to deal with cellular transport. Now I've already made a video about that right here, but I talk about them in a little more detail right here. It wants to flow from high to low concentration. So I'm going to tell you right now, interestingly, there are two ions outside of the cell that are in very high concentrations. One of those is sodium. Sodium ions are very high outside of the cell and actually relatively low inside of the cell. So if sodium gets the chance, it wants to flow high to low. Furthermore, calcium ions are also usually high outside of the cell and relatively low inside of the cell. And fun fact, too much calcium inside the cell can actually initiate cell death. So it's very important we keep calcium low. But lastly, potassium ions are actually high inside of the cell and relatively low outside of the cell. So some people say that your cells are basically bags of potassium. That's why you go bananas all the time. That was a terrible joke. So if you think about this, potassium right now wants to go high to low, inside out, whereas these guys want to flow in. But why can't they? Well, because these guys are considered polar molecules. And that means they cannot cross this membrane because the membrane for the majority is nonpolar. And polar and nonpolar do not mix well together. So in order to get these guys in or out, we have to use the proteins, okay? Now, I'm going to key into why specifically sodium and potassium are low and high inside the cell and vice versa outside the cell. Well, fun fact, 60 to 70% of your total calories go towards firing this one pump. There is a single pump in all, most all of your cells that will require 60 to 70% of your caloric intake. That's crazy. It must be pretty important. And this guy, you've probably heard of before, is called the sodium potassium pump. Okay, so I added a little extra word here, ATPase. That just means that within this protein, there's an enzyme that's going to actually cleave ATP, our energy currency molecule. And when we do that, when we cleave that ATP, as you can see in my ATP video here, we're going to basically release energy from that ATP molecule, thus doing some sort of helpful work. Now, what is the helpful work that we do? Well, the helpful work that we do is we're actually going to pump sodium, okay, from low concentration to high concentration, three sodium atoms specifically. And we're actually going to pump potassium back into the cell, specifically to potassium. Now, this whole process is called active transport because we're pumping things from low to high concentration. Now, the way we do that is we have to use that ATP because normally things like to flow high to low, but in this case, we're using energy, so therefore we're pumping low to high. Now, once we do this, sodium now is high outside the cell. So we're going to use this protein called a symport. And these symports literally translates to same direction or same transport. And most oftentimes, these are sodium symports. Sodium something symport is what I usually say. So sodium, what does sodium want to do? Well, sodium wants to flow into the cell, right? So that's what's going to happen in a symport. A sodium ion is going to flow in, but it's a symport. That means something else is going to be coming in the same direction with it, right? So one such solute that could be dragged in with the sodium's power is actually glucose. So this would be called a sodium glucose symport. Now, why are we doing this? Well, glucose is a big molecule, and as we know, glucose helps to make our energy, right? So to make ATP, we need glucose in the cell. And, but glucose is so big and it doesn't really like to move all that much, but with the power of sodium, when sodium rushes in, glucose only gets sucked in with that power and gets pulled into the cell to then be used to make ATP. Okay? So I like to use this analogy. I've got a friend, Rob, and he really wanted to go to a horror movie with me, and I hate horror movies. Okay? So what he did was he had so much energy, he actually drove to my house, grabbed me, pulled me into the car, and pulled me into the movie theater. Well, he had all this energy, sodium to pull me in, glucose, to the theater, even though I, glucose, didn't want to go in. And that's the power of a symport. Now, these symports with sodium could also be things like amino acids. So we have a lot of sodium amino acid symports. We have the sodium glucose symport. We have other symports that will bring in really important molecules. You see the importance of this pump now. Because as we continue pulling sodium in, we're going to pump it back out, thus allowing it to be pulled back in with other good things. So it's all, this is called secondary active transport. Because after primary active transport using ATP, now we can use the energy harvested in that sodium's gradient to pull other things in. That's why it's called secondary. Wonderful. Now, that's not the only type of uh, transport protein we can use. This guy over here is called an antiport. And if you think about it, that's going to mean the opposite direction. So now we've got sodium flying in, 
and we can actually pull something like hydrogen ions out. Now, hydrogen ions, we know, makes a fluid acid, right? So with hydrogen, whenever we've got a buildup in the cell, we need to sometimes get it out of the cell. So this antiport is really helpful, pulls that sodium back into the cell, throws the hydrogen out so the cell can remain in homeostasis. Wonderful. So that'd be an antiport. Now, these are all active transport proteins because there's some sort of energy required to make all this stuff happen. Now, all of these guys on the top that I put, these are all going to be passive transport proteins. And what these guys are going to do is allow things to flow high to low, passively, right? No energy required through the protein. Now, there's several different types. The first one right here is called a leak channel. And as you can infer, this allows things to just leak across the membrane from high to low. One such leak channel could be called an aquaporin. Aquaporin literally stands for water whole protein. So it will allow water to flow high to low concentration across the membrane easily. This is a very important protein in your kidneys to help filter things in and out. Now the next ones I'm going to show you up here are all called gated channels. Think of this guy as basically a wide open door. It's always open, but these guys only open when there's a specific stimulus. So these are the gated proteins. This first guy right here is called a ligand gated channel. Ligand refers to anything that binds to something. So if you look at this guy, there's going to be some sort of chemical that looks like a triangle that will be the ligand. And when the ligand, usually a chemical, binds to these receptors on the gated proteins, the gate will open up and now allow something to flow in. So let's say that it's a ligand gated sodium channel. Well, in that case, whenever the ligand is present, it'll open up and allow sodium to flow high to low, which would be outside to in. This is actually how your muscles contract, fun fact, is by ligand-gated sodium channels. Now, once the ligand gets taken away from the receptor, that will now close right back up, and sodium will not be allowed back into the cell at that point. So, basically, lock and key method. Whenever the key is in the lock, it'll be open. Whenever the key is out of the lock, it will close back up. Wonderful. Now, the next one, it looks like Harry Potter, right? Because these are called voltage-gated channels. And these guys will open when there's a specific voltage change inside the cell. Now, that sounds weird, because the cell has a charge associated with it. And usually that charge for many cells is going to be negative 70 millivolts. So if you were to test the voltage inside the cell, it'd be relatively negative. And that is due, fun fact, by a lot of proteins inside of the cell. And the proteins inside the cell that make up the cell are often very negatively charged. That makes the cell pretty negative in respect to the outside environment. So let's say this charge, for some reason or another, goes up to negative 55 millivolts maybe due to an ion coming in, making the cell more positive. That's perfectly possible. Well, at that point, this guy will open up and allow something to flow in or out, depending on what it is. So if it's a voltage-gated, once again, sodium channel, it will open up at a specific voltage change, and then sodium will be allowed to flow high to low once again. Great. And then obviously, once the voltage gets to a certain point, it will also close back up. So those are voltage-gated channels. Last one is going to be mechanically-gated channels. Now, if you think of a mechanical force, it's literally going to be just some sort of push or pull on the proteins. And once those little levers get pushed down by the force, the gates will open. Fascinating. And then once that force is gone, it'll close right back up. So this is interesting. This is actually how you feel sensations on your skin. So if something touches your skin, if you just do that, you feel that impulse going to your brain and you detect that as pressure. Well, that's because you're pressing literally down on these mechanically gated channels, thus sending a signal through your neurons to your brain. Amazing. And once again, all of these proteins came from what's called protein synthesis, from DNA to mRNA to the ribosome. So I'd highly recommend if you don't know that process, go ahead and hop to this video now, and hopefully it'll help you understand all these different concepts in biology, anatomy, and physiology, and nursing.